Hey everyone, Anarch here. And this is another episode of Anarch Abridged. However, it's kind of a unique or a special edition of Anarch Abridged. What I'm going to be doing in this video and the next few videos is offering a sort of summary of some of the video essays that I've produced on this channel. I'm doing that because I've actually had several requests to sort of boil down or simplify some of those videos. The video essays Power, A Modern Anarchism, and others, some people have said are very dense and are perhaps not aimed at mass consumption. So this is me attempting to simplify or summarize a lot of what I was talking about in those videos. I should also note that this is not just like a big overview of anarchism. This is kind of instead a way for you to become oriented in my theory of anarchism. Even though I think that the anarchism I produce is largely just comparable to social anarchism historically, there are some elements that I have uniquely introduced into my theory which were not necessarily present in the history of anarchism. Anarchism. And those are things like complexity theory, systems theory, chaos theory, but also sort of holistically integrating intersectionality and the theory of the mega machine from Lewis Mumford and things like that. So what I'm hoping to do here is provide a more succinct summary of the video's power, a modern anarchism parts one through four, and constructing the revolution all in one place. However, I know I'm not gonna be able to do that in one of these anarch abridged videos, so what I'm planning on doing is kind of stringing it out over maybe two, three, four videos, where I'm going to go into each of the topics that I talk about in those larger, more extensive expansive video essays. And that's not to say that this is a replacement for those video essays. I go into much, much more detail in those video essays. So I still highly recommend you go watch the videos. Power, A Modern Anarchism Part 1, called Anarchist Analysis. A Modern Anarchism Part 2, called Anarchy. A Modern Anarchism Part 3, which is called Revolution and soon to be released, A Modern Anarchism Part 4, which is called Organization. Lastly, there will be some inclusion of the video Constructing the Revolution. Here, I'm hoping to kind of synthesize it all together in one place. So if that sounds interesting to you, you should stick around because that is what this video and the next few Anarch Abridged videos are going to be about. So first, let's start a little bit with the topic of the video, power. In the video power, what I'm hoping to do is redevelop our understanding of this word power. What I say is that power historically, especially in anarchist literature, has largely been used in the context of what you might call power over or domination. That is to say, power is something that we exert on others. It is a form of coercion. It typically is synonymous with institutionalization of power. It is synonymous with hierarchy. It is synonymous with creating obedience in masses of people. When we talk about power, we're usually talking about the halls of power. We're talking about the republic. But here, I'm using the word power in another form, which you might call power to. My definition of power is the ability to enact one's will. One might note that this is not the same as power over or this concept of domination that we just discussed a moment ago. This definition of power is neutral by its very nature. That is to say, it contains both power with and power over. Now, why do I say that? I say that because the ability to enact one's will, that can include others. In fact, we can all become empowered by our cooperation with others, or it can come at the expense of others, over others, uh, the creation of obedience in others. So we see that power with is mostly an impulse of cooperation, 
whereas power over is mostly an impulse of domination. However, power in this definition includes all of that. So when we say we are becoming empowered, this is sort of a neutral statement by itself until we begin to qualify what kind of power it is that we're saying that we are gaining. Are we gaining power with others or are we gaining power over others? Power in a general sense is just the measure of how much I'm able to do something. It is my ability to bring some potential into actuality. That is to say, it's not just an abstract ability. It's not, for example, my ability to run a Fortune 500 company because I could probably run a Fortune 500 company. However, I don't have the power to run a Fortune 500 company. I don't have this sort of coordinating benefit of being able to go and sit on that board of trustees or sit in the position of CEO and therefore do the work of controlling the Fortune 500 company, even if I have the ability or the capability to do so. Power would be if I actually could then go do that. If I could sit on the board of a Fortune 500 company, I would then have the power to control or manage a Fortune 500 company. In the same way, I might be able to lift 250 pounds of weight, but I may not have access to 250 pounds of weight to lift. So until that I have access to 250 pounds of weight to lift, I don't actually have the power to lift 250 pounds. There has to be some coordination between my abstract ability, my potential, and the actuality of the matter. That is power. It's the coordination between potential and actuality. So this discussion about power over and power with, it sort of brings us closer to talking about what I call a power structure. And we're going to talk about different kinds of power structures here in a moment. But first, I want to talk about the anatomy of a power structure. So what is a power structure? In the work power, I define a power structure as being social and material relations which vest beings within them with power above and beyond their individual means. So let's talk about that real quick. In my work, there are four different components to a power structure. Those four components are individual conditioning, interpersonality, social structures, and environmental structures. So let's go through those one by one. What do I mean by individual conditioning? Well, by individual conditioning, I'm talking about all of those things that are the result of nature and nurture acting on some given individual. This comprises all of their psychological and biological conditions. And that includes things like your ideology, uh, you know, a system of ideas that inform your individual outlook on the world. And this includes a pretty wide variety of things as well. It includes reward seeking behavior, personal meaning, fear, trauma, delusion, bodily disfigurement or strengthening are also included. It would include also your ideology and more broadly, like, are you a capitalist? Are you an anarchist? Are you a communist? Are you a liberal? Uh, and your religious convictions, are you Buddhist? Are you Muslim? Are you Taoist? And and all of those other things. Next in the list, we have interpersonal relations. Interpersonal relations are those relations which an individual has with other conscious beings that they directly interact with. So what I mean by that is things like your friendships, your intimate partnerships, your family, the relation that you have as a worker with your boss, but also things like racism, transphobia, sexism, xenophobia, domestic abuse. These are all forms of interpersonality for better or for worse. Next is that category I call social structure. What I mean by social structure are consistent patterns at the meta individual scale that direct the flow of social power. 
and they are then reinforced by continued use of social power in some way. And I know that one sounds pretty abstract, but what I'm talking about is things like capitalist property relations, where you have private ownership over something, but also something like the state, for example, that's a social structure. So is law. Uh, white supremacy is a social structure. Patriarchy in times past the concept of honor or Bushido, chivalry, those are all forms of ancient social structures, but also things that we might want to achieve, like in an anarchic society, a communal ethic, organic societies of the past, this mutualistic ethic that we might want to have, hospitality standards that you see in a lot of places in the world. These are all social structures as well. They're sort of, you know, systems of expectation that are reinforced through behavior at the meta social scale. Lastly, we have this category environmental structures. Environmental structures are non-conceptual structures that are embodied in the non-human physical world. These are structures which were humans to cease existing, they would still remain. So everybody knows what I'm getting at when I say this, even though it's kind of hard for me to pin down precisely what I'm saying. You know, if you were to imagine that you just like deleted humans from existence, all those things in the world which would persist instantly right afterwards, those would all be examples of environmental structures. So I'm talking about things like the infrastructure we built, factories, buildings, technology, computers or armories, cars, tanks, firearms, but also the natural world more broadly. So things like forests, deserts, um, fields, animals, uh, the asteroid belts, galaxies, even natural law. These would all be examples of environmental structures. It might be easier to just call this environment. And you'll note this last category sort of gives meaning to what I'm talking about when I talk about material relations in that definition of power structures that I gave a few minutes ago. These are what I call the four fields of power structures. So one might ask, why do I even separate it into these four fields? These four fields of power structures, they give us a cleaner way to understand how power structures actually function. And that is to say, power structures function through a combination of all four of these fields. However, there are distinct characteristics about how they function on each of these individual fields. And by being able able to delineate and separate each of these four fields and kind of make sense of the dynamics for each of these four fields, it helps us be able to understand how they function and also how they might be dismantled or replaced with alternative structures. Because that's something I should note. I'm not just saying the enemy power structures function this way. Remember, a power structure is inherently a neutral affair until we start to distinguish what sorts of functions and what sorts of form that it has. That is to say, the alternative power structures that we might want to create will also be power structures. They will also function all four of these fields. They'll just have their own dynamics. So then that leads us to the discussion. What are good and bad power structures? Or I should say, what are liberatory and oppressive power structures? Oppressive power structures are hierarchical power structures. And hierarchical power structures have some unique characteristics. These unique characteristics are authoritarianism and domination. By authoritarianism, I mean the degree to which a power structure monopolizes control over the total social implementation of some power. So let's think about what it is that I'm trying to say. In order to do that, let's draw some examples here on the screen. So what we've got here is a drawing of a bunch of individuals. Each one of these dots is an individual person. We might imagine that in a default situation, without any intervention by an outside power, 
we've got people interacting in all kinds of different ways. We've got individuals interacting with one another uh, individually without any sort of intermediaries, right? This creates kind of a network of the flow of power. We might imagine that each of these lines are sort of how power flows between these individuals. Maybe it's the distribution of products. Maybe it's who they know and who they can call up in order to call in a favor and so on. Authoritarianism is when more and more of the decision making about how all of this power flows begins to be absorbed into a smaller and smaller number of these individuals. For example, let's imagine these three people are vested with what you might call authoritarian power. What does that mean? How's it going to change this graph? What it means is that all power flows from these three people now. If anybody wants to make any decisions or if anything is going to happen, it has to go through those three people. And that's not to say that they can't interact with one another, but they can only interact with one another to the degree that it goes through this intermediary, this body of people who is making decisions. And this is, of course, an extreme example. This is a very, very high degree of authoritarianism being played out here. So what you might imagine is, you know, imagine this person and that person want to communicate. Well, they can't. Instead, what has to happen is one person has to communicate with that central body and that central body then does what, what needs to be done with this other person right here, right? You know, imagine this person wants to communicate with that person. Nope, nope, they can't. They're not allowed. Instead, they have to communicate with that body and then that body now communicates with that person. So this would be the example of us having communication to be very highly authoritarian. That is to say, there's no direct communication between us. Now it's so authoritarian that we have to communicate with this central body. But that's just communication. Could also be distribution of goods. It could also be decision making in society more broadly. In fact, what you find is that as authoritarianism increases, so too does decision making become centralized in the hands of very, very few people. So this is why that authoritarianism is highly associated with centralization. This is also why I use language about the degree of authoritarianism, because this is not an on off switch, right? This is something that it can either increase or decrease based on the concentration and monopolization of powers. So, for example, you could have a, an even higher degree of centralization than I had previously illustrated. Let's say that person right there, they are the dictator. Everything that ever gets decided must be decided through them. They determine how the social flow of power takes place at a meta scale themselves. Nobody can communicate except through them. This person has all the power to make all the decisions about the social implementation of power in society. So here we have a graph of as authoritarian as this could conceivably be, right? This is why I talk about it being degree of authoritarianism. Here is the highest degree of authoritarianism in this graph. But we could also imagine a graph that is increasingly less and less authoritarian. You know, we could imagine a graph that now includes a larger group of these people, right? This is why I talk about it being more or less authoritarian, not necessarily just it is authoritarian or it is not authoritarian. You can see this graph is much less authoritarian now all power now roots to this much larger group of people. So one might look at this graph and say, oh, well, that's better. And I would say, yes, qualitatively, it is better 
to have this than the previous arrangement. However, I would argue this is still not the ideal. We're looking to not have this in group and this out group here. What we're looking to do is expand the total number of people who are involved in implementation and decision making as conceivably possible. So then we have how I use this word domination before we move on to talking about maybe more ideal power structures. When I talk about domination, I'm talking about the degree to which some power structure utilizes coercion, aggressive violence, and or deception to achieve its ends. I should also note that I'm talking about initiating the use of coercion, initiating the use of violence, initiating the use of deception. I do think that each of these things can be used in self-defense, but that will be included in a different category, which I'm going to discuss here in a moment, that I call mutuality. As you go from this graph, to this graph, to this graph, you're going to find that this system utilizes more violence, more coercive threats, and more deception in order to maintain itself. And the reason is, is because there are more and more nodes within this system that are disempowered and therefore disenfranchised from controlling the world around them. As people become disempowered, they are unable to enact their will, and that means they can't carry out their desires, which means they're going to become more miserable in the process. They're going to become more alienated from control over the world around them. And so in order for this system to maintain itself, in order to stop all of these nodes that are subjugated to this central will from rebelling, they are going to have to utilize domination. And I should also add that as one uses domination in order to bolster their power structure, they are going to tend to increase this centralization of power, and it's going to look more and more like this graph. So what is the alternative? The alternative to authoritarianism is what I call libertarianism, and that is the degree to which decisions about the implementation of total social power are socially distributed. Now, when you hear that, you might think that what I'm suggesting is that we return to that first graph, the one that looks like this. However, what I'd like to say is that I actually think we are more empowered when we return to a graph that routes all of those powers through overlapping circles. So that is to say, what you have is some group of people, let's say this group of people, they all share some interest about how they function. But also some people within this group share an interest with others. But also this entire group here they share interests, but also everybody shares some interests. But also sometimes these people will share interests and these people here, maybe they share specific interests and these people share those interests and these people all share an interest and these people share interests and so on. And what you've got is instead a bunch of bodies wherein all of these people in their particular situations with their particular interests, their particular desires, they make decisions about how power is distributed both within this uh, group of people that have things in common, but also as a group between groups. And so on and so on and so on. So you can see that I've drawn a lot more links here, right? There's a lot more complex system. In fact, the system I've illustrated here actually looks more like what complex systems analysis suggests is a complex adaptive system. 
This is closer to a diagram of how real life systems work. They are iterated, they are overlapping, they have lots of connections between each of the pieces and they are flexible to different circumstances. The system I'm demonstrating here, this demonstrates the principle of libertarianism. That is to say, this system empowers people from the bottom up. Rather than having concentration of power in the hands of very few people, what we have here is a system that empowers a very large number Number of people. And I might add, because all of these are contained in one big system, they also all have individual links. And they have individual links across all of these boundaries. They have bodies wherein they can all come together and make decisions in some big confederated body, say a general council or something, something that groups them all together by their region across all of these large spans, taking into account that they have shared interests across all different kinds of separations, that there's not just one way these are all linked together, that there are all kinds of robust ways that they can be connected together. The more of these connections are created, the more ways that each of these nodes have to route and reroute the total implementation of power, the more that I call that system libertarian. And here's the thing. This system can become less libertarian by you creating fewer and fewer of these bodies. People actually can become disempowered if they are too separated. I should emphasize that libertarianism rests on decisions about the total implementation of social power being distributed. However, if we return to this original graph, remember the graph that looks like this? This graph is not necessarily more libertarian. And let me explain why. This graph, people are not more empowered because they don't have all of these ways to be linked with one another. Those circles that I made, those are all bodies by which people are grouped together and they can use those bodies in order to make decision and conference with other bodies. So each of those circles in that diagram, those are kind of like formal decision-making bodies. However, this diagram, this this is more like the diagram of a social condition where there are no formal entities. And what I'd like to suggest is that these lines between all of the different people will never fill in completely because people are mostly only going to deal with what's right next to them. These very long lines, these don't tend to take place in real life unless there are formal bodies for coordination over long distances. People are going to tend to deal with those that are closest to them. So most of the lines that you're really going to see are going to have very short lengths. This leads to tribalism. This leads to people only focusing on their individual interests. If you don't create those bodies by which people can communicate and have an interest in communicating and making decisions over long distances and with people who maybe don't have just their own particular local interests in mind, then you're probably not going to get those much longer lengths. So what you can see here as well is that this is not a completely connected graph. And what we're told in complexity theory is that non-connected graphs are actually less robust. They respond worse to shocks. So this is actually a much less adaptive system than this system. This system would be highly, highly adaptive because if any one piece of this fails, another piece can kind of take up the need. This system if one piece of it fails, well, probably not much is going to do anything to bail out that component of the system. It's just going to fail. It is not going to be a very adaptive system. So while we're here, I want to talk about the opposite of domination. The opposite of domination is mutuality. And I kind of mentioned it a minute ago. Mutuality is the degree to which power structures utilize cooperation, self-defense, and free thought. 
So here we see this impulse of self-defense. This gives context to why that anarchists are not against violence in every occasion, right? It might be easy to read that description I had of domination about utilizing coercion, violence, and deception as saying that anarchists are universally against coercion, violence, and deception. However, this impulse of mutuality, including self-defense, was very purposeful because what I want to emphasize size here is that anarchists are not necessarily against violence, coercion, or deception. They're against those things being sort of initiated or used in order to create systems of obedience, in order to create those authoritarian systems, systems that utilize power over. And that's because anarchists view those systems as initiating this violence, as being systems of oppression, which are maintaining themselves in place. And so anarchists view the movement of a system from that authoritarian system of centralization into a system of distribution, like I showed you there in the graphs, that's an act of self-defense. Because as systems tend from this, to this, to this, they're going to tend to oppress their people more and more and more. And so it's an act of self-defense for us to make a system move from this to this to this to this. That is self-defense. The system imposing that centralized process upon us is an act of aggressive violence that we are attempting to defend ourselves from. It's almost like we're trying to stop our total social power from being parasitized by a system that looks like this. This right here, that is the behavior of a parasite. It is parasitizing the rest of this system. So I hope those diagrams helped a little bit to give you an idea about some of these principles that I've laid out here about libertarianism, authoritarianism, mutuality, domination, but also kind of like more broadly, those concepts of individual conditioning, interpersonality, social structures, and environmental structures. And I know that in one big sitting, this might be a lot to take in. So I'm going to kind of wind down just about here, but I hope that that kind of helps you understand some of the anarchist perspective, because what I've just said there, even though maybe I've used different kinds of examples, different sorts of visualizations, even different sorts of language at certain points, this is the argument that anarchists have always essentially been making in one way or another. And they spent, have spent some significant amount of time talking about why that system that I showed that overlapping system where there's lots of different connections is more robust, that it actually matches humans desires and needs the best and why that more centralized system that I showed you there is worse for us. And I just might note that that more centralized system that I was telling you about there, that more authoritarian system, that is a system like the state. That is like the corporation. That's like being in a business. Did you see the way all the lines point to that central function? That person could be the CEO. That person could be the president. That person could be the king. That person could be your lord in your area. It just depends on what scale you're looking at. That's why that capitalism cannot be a part of anarchism. That's why the state cannot be supported by anarchists. But that's also why that no form of oppressive violence in that sense can actually be made acceptable under any circumstances. We can only justify this sort of self-defensive impulse to distribute power to larger and larger numbers of people. However, we're going to get into the process by which we might actually dissolve that power and distribute it in a later part of this series of summaries. For now, I'm going to leave you all with that because I imagine that it might have been kind of over.
overload. However, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, just know that it took me quite a bit more effort to make a video like this. But anyway, I think that's about it for this video. I just want to say that if you sat all the way through that, I really appreciate you paying such close attention and listening for so long. But also I want to say, please become a patron at my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash anarch. Also, if you can't afford to become a patron, do the free stuff. Go click like and subscribe to the channel and go comment down below and tell me all your thoughts, whether you like this video and you didn't like this video, whether you have questions, concerns, confusion, whatever it is. However, I think that's about it. I've said pretty much everything I want to say, at least for today's video, and I'll see y'all next time.